you so much, Donna and Claire Louise. It's really nice to be here. Um, it reminds me of the lovely energy that was present when I actually visited Bristol. Just a really fresh and welcoming, warm kind of energy. And I, I feel that already this morning. So yeah, for those who do know me, I need to say nothing. <laughs> uh, for anyone who doesn't, um, so what to say? Well, I was ordained about 15 years ago now in Burma. I spent the first four or five years of my monastic life there. Uh, and then a couple of years in Europe, kind of as an itinerant nun, because I had nowhere to stay. So I was visiting different monasteries and then finally got the chance to go to Perth to meet my, well, to stay with my teacher, Ajahn Brown, um, and train there for several years before he asked me to come back to England and see if I could establish something for women over here. Now, it's not only for women, <laughs> but we are trying to set up a monastery. So I have my first base here in Oxford. And the idea is that we want to continue to build community, especially community on the ground, to offer the teachings of early Buddhism in an accessible and approachable way, I hope, and to eventually um, look towards purchasing something that will um, be a forest monastery, basically, or an English countryside rolling hills monastery. Uh, where all people can come and stay, no matter what your gender, your race, your background, your ability, or, you know, so-called not um, ordinary ability, super normal ability, whatever that may be, you can all come. And it will also be a place where women can train towards the full ordination, because at the moment I'm the only fully ordained nun in the whole country. So it gets kind of lonely and I need some company and I would love for this opportunity to be available to, to women who want to have the same uh, foundation in training and the same opportunity to walk the path that the Buddha laid out. So this is something that needs to be done. We need to have choices and more opportunities for people to come together, as Donna was saying, to come together in person and to practice, because there's a certain power, there's a certain um, support that we get from being together. And so we have managed to do that through the Zoom sessions, and I'm sure there's been a lot of teachings through Bristol Insight and also through my own groups. And so it's lovely to be here today and to practice empowering our mindfulness, yeah? So, about the theme. <laughs> this came about because obviously mindfulness is a huge phenomenon now. It's exploded in Western societies in the last sort of 20, 30 years. And um, I was reading a little part of a book called Mindful America by Jeff Wilson. And he kind of traced this movement back to three main things that happened in recent times. The first was the establishing of the IMS, Insight Meditation Center or Society, I think, in uh, Massachusetts, um, which was founded by uh, Sharon Salzberg, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield in 1976. And then also the therapeutic form of mindfulness that John Kabat-Zinn um, made very popular and accessible, you know, that led to some of the um, mindfulness training courses, mainly for psychological well-being uh, in a very secular way. And then the popularizing efforts of uh, the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, Vietnamese monk, who um, has done a lot of work in engaged Buddhism as well. And this really laid the foundations for making the teachings of mindfulness accessible to lay people, um, not only in the West, but also from where it began in Burma through the efforts of a monk called Ledi Sayadaw uh, in the late 1800s. He actually had the foresight and the vision to bring these teachings out of the monasteries, away from you know, being the sole domain of monastics and into the society in an attempt to conserve and preserve and empower the lay people to be, in a sense, guardians of the Dhamma, right? Guardians of mindfulness. But in this process, um, mindfulness has become increasingly kind of separated from its roots and, you know, to some good effect in the sense that it's more widely available and it can be a stepping stone for people um, into taking more interest in the Buddha's teachings as a whole and seeing the context of that mindfulness. But sometimes it also strays into completely different areas and different motives. So we have mindfulness 
in the corporate world to actually increase productivity and increase profit, right? Good, bad, who knows? as my teacher Ajahn Brown says. But we also have it sort of straying into areas such as like mindful sex, um, even like mindfulness in the army, which I mean, I really hope they have the ethical restraint involved there. Otherwise you can be very good at pointing a gun, right? And the thing with this is that it's, you know, especially when it goes into things like mindful pleasures of the senses, it's actually starting to turn in the complete opposite direction from what mindfulness was intended for by the Buddha. So he wasn't trying to enhance our sensory experience. He was actually trying to point us towards a different kind of pleasure, the pleasure of the mind, the pleasure that comes through deep meditation, which is actually um, removed from the five sense world. So it's a kind of pleasure of virtue, a pleasure of goodness, a pleasure of peace a different kind of happiness that's available to us um, eventually in any condition, in any circumstance, yeah? And so this has a very different, uh, a different uh, kind of approach and also a different outcome, obviously, because it's taking us beyond that sensual world. And the other issue with the mindfulness as, as the way it's taught in the secular world is that very rarely it talks about ethics, it talks about virtue. And nor does it talk about the one of the foundations of mindfulness, which is um, mindfulness of mental contents, that would actually include the Four Noble Truths, normally speaking. So it would include understanding suffering, the cause of suffering, the way to the end of suffering, and the end of suffering itself, and also the awakening factors. So it would go through mindfulness into investigation of reality and then into all these beautiful factors that comprise part of um, deep meditation. So energy and then joy, rapture, tranquility and samadhi states themselves, like deep meditation that is taking you to a very deep source of happiness within the mind. So, and the other thing about this is that um, there are different levels to mindfulness. And that's why I wanted to talk about mindfulness today because we have the ordinary kind of mindfulness that everybody has, you know, like even a drunk person, you'd say that they're pretty unmindful, right? Model minded or completely lost uh, their senses in a, in a way. But even a drunk person can find their way home in the dark. So there's still a modicum of mindfulness there. And an ordinary person always has some amount of mindfulness. It's just that we don't necessarily have enough to see things as they really are, or we don't have enough, as long as what we call the five hindrances are actually operating in our minds. So those five hindrances are um, sense desire, wanting, craving, ill will or aversion, negativity, anger, um, doubt well that's the last one actually the next one is um uh drowsiness drowsiness and sort of uh, uh tiredness you could say sleepiness drowsiness lethargy you know when you when your mind's very sleepy you can't see clearly you know everything it's even an effort sometimes to open your eyes you know and just to kind of make out where you are and what you've got to do for the day uh and then restlessness and worry or remorse, this is another hindrance. We can't stay with what's, what's uh, happening because our mind is just going back over what's happened in the past or worrying about the future. And then the doubt, not being sure, being confused maybe about the path, about the practice or about what you're actually aware of, not really being clear about what's arising in the mind. So when there are these five hindrances present, we don't have strong mindfulness. We just have a preliminary kind of mindfulness. And um, the first kind of task, in a sense, is to employ however much mindfulness you have to be able to see more deeply into how we can overcome these five hindrances to shine up the mind. Yeah, so we can take that mindfulness into what I've coined for the day, power mindfulness. That comes from my teacher, Ajahn Brown. So the kind of mindfulness that's really strong and can start actually seeing exactly what's going on. And then we can take that even deeper into deep states of samadhi where it becomes like superpower mindfulness and you have such a penetrating, um, stable kind of clear awareness, clear mindfulness. It's like a mega watt kind of football stadium light. <laughs> Nothing can hide, right? It can, it can see everything. 
um, including things you maybe didn't expect to see or maybe even didn't really want to see. I mean, who really wants to see, if we're honest, who really wants to see um, suffering and the way that suffering is arising, the way that we are perpetuating suffering for ourselves and others? Like who really wants to see that what we take to be a self is not really a self at all, it's just a process. You know, it's a conditioned phenomenon, if you like. Um, that's scary to see. And as long as those hindrances are there, they'll keep averting us. So, is that right? Averting or diverting us from those truths. Mm -hmm. So I'm already going into kind of the deeper stages here, but I, I wanted to just come right back down, first of all, and define mindfulness the way that the Buddha defined it, because it might give you a, a broader idea about what it is where we're talking about. Yeah? This is not just being aware. So according to the Buddha, mindfulness is that faculty of mind that knows the content of the present moment. Mm -hmm. So we know the content of the present moment, but it also can sustain its focus on the present moment long enough to start seeing deeply into reality, the way things really are. Mm -hmm. So we'll get into that later, because at this point we can argue very much about the way things really are. And basically, as long as those hindrances are there, we're not really seeing things um, in their fullness. The second um, aspect of mindfulness is actually coming from the word sati. The word sati uh, in Sanskrit is smriti. And smriti actually means memory. So that's very interesting. My first teacher, um, Goenka, he used to say, how can mindfulness be memory? You know, you don't sit there and just think about the past. You have to be mindful of what's happening now. But another way of understanding it as a kind of memory, um, straight from the text, the Buddha says, is that one remembers what was done or said a long time ago. And of course, this is very useful if you're like studying for exams or, um, what happened with somebody in an interaction that's a bit more you know, subjective because our emotions are involved, but certainly it sort of points towards being present. And if you are really present now, then you will be able to remember things much more clearly, you know, things that have happened in the past. But as far as our meditation is concerned, I like to think of it more as remembering the instructions, remembering what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah? Because it's all very well, as I said, being mindful of something but is that really the way the Buddha intended you to be aware is that the really the right content that you need to be looking at in order to free yourself from suffering or are there certain areas that you need to be focusing that mindfulness upon so remembering the instructions our intention our purpose and also our goal you know that it is possible to um, find a kind of inner peace that is beyond the sensual realm. This is really possible, not only in the past 2,600 years ago, but even today. And the path is progressively taking us in that direction. And I always think, you know, so many of us say, oh yeah, I know that I should be mindful. Like I, I know that, but I forget that I should be mindful. Isn't that the problem? <laughs> we know we should, but we forget. And so this also, you can see why it's so important to have that aspect of memory involved. It's like a guiding part of the mind in the background that's there. It's like, oh, remember, you know, you're washing up right now. Be aware, be aware of like the sensations of the water on the hands. Is it too hot, too cold? Will it be fit for purpose to remove the grease or the, you know, the embedded the caked up food from the pots? So you, you become aware, you become present with that. And you might even start to find some joy in simple things like washing up, you know, or I don't know, taking the rubbish outside. It can be a very mindful activity when you know why you're doing it and, and, um, and you're really present for that. Otherwise we waste so many moments of our lives. They just go by and we say, oh, I don't know how 10 years has passed. You know, what happened? Like, what have I been doing? You know, or a year of lockdown, a year of isolation. What have I actually done? <laughs> you know, because we're not aware, we're not present and we forget mindfulness. So many hours even of the day. On the other hand, it's not to judge ourselves. Every moment we remember is a moment of mindfulness. And that is a step in the right direction. That is progress, water in the tank. 
So the third aspect of mindfulness is a kind of clarity or presence of mind. So the opposite of that is like absence of mind, forgetting, being muddle-minded, you know, kind of plodding your way through the day, not in a bit of a cloud, a bit of a daze. And the idea of this um, presence and clarity is that um, mindfulness should be objective, should be kind of what we call bare, B-A-R-E. Many of you might know my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, and he's changed the word bear into teddy bear, like B-E-A-R, bear awareness, which is very wise, very smart, because it's so hard to have bare, objective, you know, non-judgmental, non-invested mindfulness, as I said, because the hindrances are involved. So much of the time we're seeing what we expect to see, or we're not seeing what we don't want to see, you know, when we're angry, we see a person's faults. We think, how could we ever have got along with them? You know, maybe all those qualities I saw in them were actually ways to manipulate me or however it is that your perception now distorts the truth. So this bare awareness is supposed to happen at the level, the bare level of sense contact. Something comes into the eye sense door, an impression arises, a visual uh, form arises in the eye and we're just aware of that without liking disliking just knowing what's there but this is very difficult as I say because of the hindrances and so it isn't yet a, an awareness that we can trust we think we have bare awareness but it's not the full picture we can't yet trust it and that's why bare awareness b-e-a-r is so helpful because when we had kind of fluffy <laughs> it's this idea of having a teddy bear and giving it um, some meta but it basically is this, um, a metaphor for having loving kindness along with the mindfulness and when we can have that loving kindness with the way we're aware so we're aware in a open-hearted um, unconditional welcoming kind of way then that mindfulness actually has extra strength to overcome the first of these hindrances, the first and the second, the craving and the ill will. That kindness, that bare, B-E-A-R awareness is actually acting as um, a power to overcome those hindrances as well. And then another aspect of mindfulness is that it is directed to certain areas of existence, certain areas of our experience. So as I said, we don't really want to be directing it at peaceful demonstrators on the streets of Myanmar. Hmm? You know, how well we can shoot them according to the orders we've taken. That's an extreme kind, but you could definitely say those soldiers are mindful, right? They're very aware, very alert. But we want to direct this onto the areas of experience where we basically assume a self to hang out. So those areas um, in the Buddhist teachings are, are talked about as the four satipatthanas, the four focuses of mindfulness. And that is the body, the feelings or sensations that can be mental or physical, and the aspect of those feelings and sensations that is pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in between and then the mind the different mental states and the mental contents as I said before so the things that arise in the mind the mental contents and in particular the four noble truths and the seven awakening factors because these are the things which they're almost like the awakening factors are, are also the opposite of the hindrances the awakening factors develop when the hindrances start to be overcome and the Four Noble Truths are the areas that we need to investigate to understand fully in order to free ourselves from that suffering. So this is already including an aspect of wisdom as well, as you can see, right? Sati and Panya, or sometimes called Sati Panya or sat, um, Sati Sampajanya. It's kind of the same thing. So we're not only concerned with what we're aware of, but why we were aware we are aware of that particular phenomena and how suitable is what we are doing to the goal you know is the way we're using our mind suitable to actually bring us closer to that goal or not 
you know, am I just sitting here kind of winding myself up, criticizing myself? Oh, I can never get it right. Even now I can't do this. Is that leading you to the goal or not? Or is that creating more suffering, indulging in the causes of suffering, ill will towards yourself? So we start to become wise to the way we're using our mind and also recognize that there are these different levels of mindfulness. So there's the mindfulness, which is ordinary. There's the mindfulness, which is like a power mindfulness when the hindrances start to be um, restrained. And then there's the super power mindfulness. And each of these is capable of different functions. It's also important to say that along with the mindfulness increasing, your mind is waking up. And because of that, more energy is pouring into the mind. So as mindfulness increases, energy also starts to increase. And with that energy, a lot of joy. Yeah. So sometimes when we're depressed, we can look at it as a kind of state where there's very little energy. And often what's needed at that point is just to rest a lot. Sometimes our body actually enforces us to do that forces us rather to do that you know it just literally kind of melts down and you can't get up in the morning um, and sometimes it's better just to go with that if it's a kind of mildish depression obviously sometimes it might be important to take medication to see the doctor but sometimes it's just that the mind is exhausted and it has no energy and because of that lack of energy there's no joy so as this mindfulness builds the joy builds the happiness builds and because of that, we start to see much more into the object of our awareness. And that object starts to look beautiful, starts to look bright. It starts to capture our awareness, capture our attention, so that we don't even want to move away from something as simple and ordinary as the breath. Yeah? The mindfulness starts to see deeply into that breath and it starts to shine. And this is where, you know, objects like the breath can start to turn into mental objects like the bright nimitters or the lights in the mind. They become kind of supercharged. Your mind's literally waking up. So initially in the suttas, it says that um, this mindfulness is to prevent lapses in our ethical conduct. Yeah. So we have a bit of mindfulness and it allows us to see when we're going to break into unwholesome um, acts of body or speech or even mental um, unwholesome behavior. And also to restrain and guard it from these five hindrances because they, the Buddha says, they're obscurations of the mind that weaken wisdom and nourish delusion. So we want to restrain these first of all. And then eventually we actually are able to abandon those hindrances altogether as they start to fade. And we can enter these deep states of samadhi. And at that point, your mindfulness is actually superpower mindfulness. And you can see deeply into the nature of things. Yeah. In the suttas, it says, samadhi pacheya yata bhuta jnana dasana. That means samadhi, deep meditation, the jhanas are the cause of seeing things as they truly are. So why is that? And the, really, again, it relates to the absence of these hindrances. So there's no more wanting in the mind. So the awareness, the mind is not biased. You know, it's even free to see something new, something unexpected. Yeah? You freed your mind from what it expects to see and you can be open to something else. There's no restlessness anymore. There's no worry. So your mind is stable. It can penetrate deeply into things. There's no drowsiness. So when there's no drowsiness, your mind is lucid and bright. It's literally waking up the lights in the mind. And then there's no doubt. So without doubt, you can be really confident that what you're seeing is according to reality. Yeah, you can really trust in those insights that arise. Of course, insights arise all the way along the path, you know, and, and initially a lot of them are just insights into the way our mind is working, the way that suffering arises and that we um, exacerbate or increase that by reacting to the unpleasant, mm -hmm. what we call double dukkha, double suffering something unpleasant arises and then the mind says, I don't want that, that was double dukkha. So initially that's the kind of insight that arises, but at this stage you can actually have the insight that can um, get you out of all suffering. And in the text, I just want to read this out because um, the Buddha talks about this and this is the kind of mindfulness that arises after 
cultivating deep samadhi. So he says, then we can dwell contemplating the body in the body or the feelings in the feelings, the mind in the mind, the mental states in the mental states, having removed longing and dejection for the world in regard to the world. That basically means the craving and the aversion towards this world of five senses. Then wherever we walk, stand, sit, or lie down, we will do so with ease. And that person, in this case, a monastic, um, is heedful, ardent, and resolute, and realizes the consummation, the end of the holy life. Destroyed is birth. Uh, the spiritual life has been lived. Done is what had to be done. There's no more coming to any state of existence. <laughs> this is straight from the suttas. And it's a way of speaking that the Buddha uses quite a lot, but I find it so joyful. Done is what had to be done. The holy life has been lived. There's no more becoming or no more coming to any state of existence. To me, that just gives such hope that even such a thing can be possible. And I don't know if that sort of ignites the same inspiration in everybody here. It doesn't matter if it doesn't, because each step of the way you can experience a release of suffering every time that you're aware um, in a way that's kind, that's gentle, that makes peace. You can experience a release of tension, a release of the fight, the struggle within yourself. So I want to talk about how we build that mindfulness because it's actually quite counterintuitive. So I've already given a lot of sort of technical background and information, but <clears throat> the actual process is much more intuitive and it's more of a non-doing. So my teacher sometimes says it's a won't power rather than a willpower. <laughs> So instead of saying, right, now I have to establish my mindfulness, we actually say, what can I stop doing that's interfering with this natural mindfulness from just arising? So mindfulness is not a tool that we exploit for our benefit. It's not like, how do I use this mindfulness for my advantage? It's more about putting the causes in place. It's something that arises due to certain causes. And as I said, you know, of course, virtue and sense restraint in daily life, you know, performing good deeds, abstaining from sort of things that would harm ourselves or others <clears throat> are some of those causes. But as far as the meditation is concerned, it's really about just being able to stay present and also prevent any leaks. So there's this simile of like a water tank and it's a huge water tank. We used to have them in Perth where I lived in the forest. We had rainwater tanks and the water would come down all the kind of pipes and uh, through, from the gutters, you know, and come into these tanks. And you didn't really know how full they were. You couldn't see over the top. Um, but you could be sure that every drop that went in would, you know, increase the amount of water in that tank. But there's one, and it's the same with mindfulness, right? Like I say, every moment of awareness, every moment that we regain our senses, we remember what we're supposed to be doing is progress on the path as long as there's no leak in that water tank. <laughs> and so you could see the leaks in the water tank as the five hindrances again, the places where the water gets out. So you're building your mindfulness and then something comes in your mind like anger or craving or even just a slight lack of contentment with where you are. And you'll find that there's like a shadow in the mind, the, the mindfulness just starts to drain, the happiness recedes. And that's like, because you haven't plugged up the leak. So the first job of mindfulness, as well as staying present, is to also look at how we can plug up those leaks, those holes in the rainwater tank. Yeah. The other simile that um, is quite pertinent to me because I had this experience again in, in Perth on a, a long retreat. It's, uh, it's a little bit like in the beginning, your mindfulness is not that sharp. It's a bit like walking into a darkened room. You go into that room and your eyes are accustomed to very bright places and you don't see anything, right? You can't see a thing. So you go into that room and after a while, you just wait, you just stay present. You just trust that your eyes are gonna start receiving the input. And then bit by bit, you can see a few shapes and then you wait a bit more and then you start to see textures. You start to see colors 
you start to be able to say, oh, there's a table or there's a chair. So you just go into that room and you give it time, you give your eyes time to um, customize. You don't go in and say, come on, eyes, come on, you know, oh, <laughs> open up. You're not pushing it that way. You're just literally allowing the lights of the mind to come, to turn on. And this happened to me during one main's retreat, as I say, um, where it was about the sixth week. And I guess there was a bit of discontent thinking that my mindfulness should be a bit stronger by now. Of course, that's judgment and, and, and all the rest. But Ajahn Brown gave me some very wonderful advice. He said, really do nothing, just do nothing. And even at this stage in the retreat, you'll probably go through some drowsiness. You'll probably go through some dullness, but just stay with it and don't let the mind move. Just stay with it. And after a while, two, three days, your mind will start waking up. So for once, I really followed his instructions. And, you know, he was also saying, don't think. And it's like, okay, don't think. But I mean, it's hard not to think. But anyway, I really did my best to just, even if the thought would arise, I just don't follow it. Or I just don't make a big deal. I just, you know, don't give it much attention, much space in my mind. So I just let it go, let it go. Just don't, don't move my awareness. Whatever arises, keep that watcher, keep that knower still. There is no knower really, but you know, just as a simile, you can think of the awareness as like the knowing part of the mind. So keep that one still. And I went through this uh, sloth and torpor, sort of drowsiness, not being quite oriented with what was going on. But then gradually, gradually, it just started to lift. And I found that the mind, when it did start to brighten up, it brightened up in a very balanced way. There wasn't any agitation, there wasn't any restlessness. Because sometimes if we use the willpower instead of the won't power, we uh, swing from drowsiness to a kind of restless, kind of quite tense sort of awareness. But in this case, the awareness was just perfectly poised and there was no thinking and all this joy very subtle at first, just started to arise and the breath just would come in to the mind in a way that was so easy to be with. You know, it wasn't this idea that there's the breath and I have to go and get it or I have to stay with it. It would just come to me. And it just seems so obvious at that point that this is how you meditate, you know, and that most of the time we're going far too quickly onto the breath or far too quickly onto any object of our awareness before we've really given the mind time to just wake up a little bit in the beginning. So this was a really um, interesting experience and it also showed me how when there's mindfulness present, you really don't need much effort at all. <clears throat> so where are those holes is the next question. <laughs> and as I already suggested, they are in that place between the so-called knower and the known, right? So there's the mind that's aware and there's the objects of awareness. But what we often don't realize as meditators is that there's something in between, there's a place. Even Viktor Frankl said this actually, that in that space we have the freedom to respond. And as far as the Buddhist teachings go, it's in that space where these hindrances arise. Like there's no defilement in an object, there's nothing essentially good or bad about an object of the senses. The mind, if it's just aware, is just aware. But it's in that space, in the relationship we have with what we're aware of, that these hindrances tend to arise. And so it's in that space that we can plug up the holes, plug up the leaks to our rainwater tank. So basically, it, again, it's a very subtle, a very gentle, uh, almost non-doing. But what we do is employ the three right intentions, the second factor of the Eightfold Path. And again, this is something that's often neglected when talking about mindfulness. It's our attitude of mind. It's the way we relate to the objects in the mind. It's in a sense, if you like, our motivation. So instead of having ill will, aversion, you know, grasping, we actually have these beautiful three right intentions and they are loving kindness, gentleness or non-harm and an attitude of letting go, making peace. They're the three right intentions. So these become like the guardians of the mind. They protect us from those five hindrances. They protect us from, yeah, the grasping, the craving, the ill will. And they act as um, 
a kind of very subtle perception that we infuse our awareness with. So it's not just bear awareness, remember, it's B-E-A-R awareness. So that bear is kind, gentle, and, <laughs> and makes peace, just the way you feel when you cuddle a teddy bear. I don't know if you're all into teddy bears yet, but you will be if you come to any of <laughs> my talks again. Anyway, I never liked them as kids, but now I've got a few teddy bears to remind me of kindness. So let's talk about kindness, first of all. So this is... Um, what the Buddha talks about is avyapada, and it's a, a synonym for metta, for loving kindness, non-ill will. So we imbue, it's as though, you know, the mindfulness is like the light, as I said, of the mind, but the kindness is like the warmth. So you have these two aspects to your awareness. You have the light and you have the warmth, like you do with the sun. The light imparts, the sun imparts light. Yeah, it illuminates everything, everybody. It shines on everybody impartially but it also warms us up. So we like to sit outside, you know, when, especially in England, whenever the sun comes out and kind of soak up those rays of sun, the brightness lifts us up, you know. Often we go through this seasonal affective disorder in the winter because there's so much darkness. So the light lifts us up, brightens our mood, but then the sun warms and relaxes us and we can sit outside for a while, you know, maybe you want to eat your lunch out there and just take in some of that warmth. And as I say, the light shines, the sun particularly shines on all impartially. It doesn't matter if they're good people, bad people, protesters, uh, oppressors, you know, the sun just shines on all beings equally. And in the same way, our mindful awareness, our kindfulness, as Ajahn Brown calls it, uh, it receives, it, it shines on all objects that come into our mind without preference, without judgment. It just welcomes all things into the mind, into awareness. So in that sense, it's a kind of unconditional mindfulness. Yeah. And this is a really important aspect of mindfulness. It's unconditional in nature. When we talk about kindness, we talk about metta, we sometimes define it as unconditional love. So even as a mother protects her only child with her life, she protects all living beings. Yeah. It's not the case that metta for um is equated to a mother's love for her child. It's the mother's love for a child extended to all beings. So there's a big difference there. And that is the challenge, that is the difficulty because some beings that come into your mind, you will take objection to. You'll say, I don't want this same old line, <laughs> you know, the same old story that I've been telling myself most of my life. I don't want this again, you know, and we have a version Whereas metta will just say, oh, look, it's come in. How can I be kind? How can I care for this moment? How can I just welcome it and say, oh, they're there, you know, don't worry. You're welcome too. And that will take out all the charge. You know, that will take out so much of the problem. And after a while, these things will fade away. So, you know, they're never overcome. The Buddha says anger is never overcome or hatred is never overcome by hate. By love alone, it's overcome. And this is how we start to infuse or suffuse our awareness with kindness. And there have been some studies actually that done on uh, mindfulness and, uh, and, and its effects. Some uh, very good studies, I think mostly in the USA. Um, there's a person called Judson Brewer, uh, who's done a lot of these and talks about them in his latest book, I think. Um, and they found that just having mindfulness doesn't always decrease suffering because we become more aware of the suffering. And if our mind is not ready for that, it can actually heighten the pain. But when you have mindfulness and loving kindness together, and in these reports, I'm not sure if they were actually practicing both mindfulness and loving kindness at the same time or at different times, but the idea was that they were cultivating both. It actually also makes you more aware of suffering, but also much more um, able to tolerate that, that your resilience goes up. And you also have a lot more altruism and warmth. So it tends to translate into alleviating the suffering, not only for yourself, but for others. And basically it had better results. There was much more happiness in the mind. It lit up reward centers in the brain that are responsible for positive feelings, you know and a sense of warmth and caring and kindness. So when the two are together, it has much more powerful effects. 
So the next one is gentleness, yeah, kindness, and then gentleness. And the literal translation for that is um, avihimsaka, that means non-harm. It's like Mahatma Gandhi's ahimsa, yeah, so non-violence. And so much of the time we do a kind of violence with the mind. So the object comes in and we're like, okay, let me have it, let me grab it, this is mine. Especially if it's something like bright lights in the mind or something you haven't experienced, like there's this sense that oh, I want this, you know, and we grab onto it. That is a kind of violence. It's, a, it's not being gentle enough with the mind. So gentleness is not grabbing the object or grasping it tightly. It's more like the kind of um, mind which is open and receptive, which is wide. So the way that you'd hold like a little birdie. And this is actually from the suttas as well. You know, if you hold a little bird too tightly, you crush it. If you hold it not tightly enough, it flies away. But if you get that touch just right, you know, a very gentle touch that allows the bird to know you're there, it bestows some warmth, again, the kindness on that bird, but it's just present, just present, almost like the mist. Very, very gentle, non-invasive. And the mind becomes like that. It becomes wider, more expansive, almost like just a very misty background to, to your awareness. So it's not right up in front of the object. It's not sort of staring it down. It's more something that's pervasive and wide, like a gentle giant. Yeah, that sort of imaginary gentle giant. My teacher said that to me and I thought it was quite funny because he is like a dental giant. <laughs> he's almost like he's become the personification of that kind of awareness. It's really sweet. So, and also giving them room, giving things room to arise and pass in their own time. Yeah, because we can be like, okay, things arise and pass, but when is this gonna pass? I want this to pass. The mind has a door in, things arise but the mind has a door out as well. Things can pass away in their own time. So we don't worry about that. We just let them come in, let them go like clouds in the sky. We're just gentle to them when they're there. And after a while they go on their own. So all of these are sort of very similar, the kindness, the gentleness, and now the letting go. And of course with letting go, we can also sometimes misinterpret that to mean that we have to get rid of things or push them away. But the first stage of letting go is more like a letting be. It's more like a letting things just be there and making peace with them, yeah? So one of the first things that's difficult, of course, is to let go of the past and the future. Right? When we sit down, it's really hard to arrive in the present moment because we're so concerned with what happened before, maybe regrets or remorse, or we're so sort of escaping into imaginary fantasies of the future. But the thing with the future is that it's actually nothing but a, a fairy tale, right? And, or, I mean, it can be a fairy tale or it can be kind of a nightmare scenario if we have negativity towards the future, <laughs> yeah, then it turns into worry. But whatever case, I mean, we can't actually live that future until it becomes the present moment. It can only ever exist in the here and now. So we really need to learn to find beauty, peace and contentment now, because you know, when the future arrives, it arrives always in the form of the present. So the best thing you can ever do for your future is to make peace now, to learn a wise relationship, a wholesome way of relating to the present and finding contentment now. I wrote down a little quote from um, Socrates, which I'll just share, because this is really pointing at the kind of uh, fallacy of anything being better in the future. So he said one, he said he, but I'm going to say one to be inclusive. One who is not contented with what they have would not be contented with what they would like to have. <laughs> right? Because it's a certain skill to be able to see the joy in the now, to be able to be content and relaxed with what's arising in the present, making peace with that. And if you can do that now, you'll do that in the future too, no matter what happens. Yeah. So it's a kind of way to make good karma as well. You're making good, as Ajahn Brahm says, making good meditation karma. You're, you're finding the right attitudes and ways of relating. And so that will only need to happiness later on. So that's one way of making peace, you know, just learning to be peaceful with the way things are arising for us now. 
but also there's a way to kind of de develop a perception of the present moment. And it's a subtle thing. We'll try it out in the meditation in a couple of minutes, but it's a kind of learning to be aware of the quality of experience that is now. It doesn't really matter what is arising now, whether it's sensations, breath, thoughts, it's just getting a perception of the nowness of it. <laughs> Does that sound weird? Sounds a bit weird. So it's a kind of perception of presence. What does it mean to be present? And it can take a little bit of getting used to, but after a while, it, it, it becomes a perception in and of itself. So if you start to find you're slipping off into the future or the past, you remember how it feels to be like poised in now. And that place becomes almost like a place that you can come back to in your mind. You can just re, um, what's the word? Like recollect yourself, recollect uh, this present moment and just rest in that space. So the other thing about making peace, letting go is to, be in that present moment without expectations, without demands, without wishing it to be different, without expecting it to be different. And expectations are not always sort of um, cravings, you know, may something happen to me. Expectations can also come from a sense of a lack of capability or a lack of self-worth. So we can actually expect things not to happen, like, oh, I'll never get into deep meditation. That's also an expectation. So you're kind of, you know, what do you call it? Transferring your experience of the past onto the present moment. Oh, it never happened before, so it can't happen now. That's an expectation. Whether you're expecting something good or something negative to happen, you're still kind of imposing your ideas, you're imposing your limitations on the present. And that present moment is not free to evolve in its own time, in its own way. And then, yeah, just, just the point that by making peace, you know, by making peace, we're starting to become still. We're starting to actually experience peace because whatever the way we're aware starts to become what we're aware of. If you make peace long enough, after a while, you'll notice that what you're actually watching is peace that peace starts to develop in the mind. And at this point, it's very important to stay still. Yeah? Again, my teacher says it's like we want to starve the doer, the doing part of the mind, because that's where our energy starts to drain. It's also the doing part of the mind where those hindrances come in. So we don't give that doing part energy, but we get let all the energy flow into knowing. We just remain present, we just simply know and we let that mindfulness start to build. And with that mindfulness, the energy starts to build. You know, the leaks are plugged up, it all starts to accumulate. And our mind becomes happy and joyful. We need less sleep. Many of you might have been on retreat where you start to find you don't need as much sleep. The food starts to taste really nice, you know, or the trees start to look particularly green. Even one leaf can be so fascinating because the mind is starting to see much more deeply. So at this point, again, you know, just staying still, just not allowing that energy to flow out into the places that um, it doesn't need to flow into. Okay, so <laughs> that was a lot. I always tend to give quite a lot of content because even if you can't and you're not expected to keep it in the mind now, maybe something in there will speak to you in different ways different things will speak to different people and uh, yeah it will come up when you need it in your meditation so just let anything that doesn't speak to you right now fall away and trust that whatever you need will be there so shall we do some meditation together for about half an hour or so if you want to have a stretch or change your posture please do so I think we're probably good for drinks at the moment so no tea break yet but you'll be getting a break shortly a nice long break and just noticing already that when you change your posture when you move from one mode to the next can you keep your mind relatively still so that your body might be moving but your mind is not commenting see if you can keep that energy within
So just while you're getting settled, I'm going to respond to a question. Very easy one to repeat that quote again. Oops. Ooh, ooh. So that quote was, one who is not contented with what they have would not be contented with what they would like to have. So grass is greener, isn't it? <laughs> we always think we'll be happy someplace in the future. The grass is greener over there. But we have to learn how to be content. Otherwise, whatever arises will just pass us by. We won't really see its beauty. So let's see if we can develop some contentment in this present moment. So closing your eyes when you can, if you're comfortable to do that. Some people like to keep a slight gap in their eyes. It depends how you've been trained before. And notice how you're sitting. Ask your body if it's really the way it needs to sit. Don't assume anything. Give your body time to respond. So as you're sitting and the eye sense door is quietened, allowing any visual impressions to fade, whilst retaining a sense of connection, support from this lovely meditation group. And as you come in contact with your body sitting, perhaps starting by becoming aware of the top of the head. Take a few moments to establish not only mindfulness of any sensations in that area, but also an attitude of kindness. Perhaps noticing that the sensations of the object, the known, recognizing this sense of the knower or the knowing of those sensations, your mindfulness. and checking that space in between, the way you're relating to whatever's arising in this present moment in the form of any sensation on the top of the head. as though the sun was shining on the top of your head, illuminating all kinds of different experiences there, maybe tingling, maybe coolness or warmth, perhaps throbbing or pulsing or in any areas where there isn't very much sensation at all. And also that warmth of the sun. It uses the mindfulness as a kind of channel, a medium through which that kindness, that warmth can flow. So we're not trying to change anything, get anywhere, have anything more pleasant 
And what's right here? You're just trying to care for this moment. Care for the sensations on the top of the head. And allowing in your own time that kindfulness, kind awareness to flow down through the face area. Exploring any sensations on the brow, noticing how that kind awareness relaxes tension, as though you were basking your face in the warm golden sunshine. Allowing the cheeks, the jaw to relax. Welcoming any sensations in the area of the face. recognizing whether that awareness is kind, welcoming, accepting, by its effects on the body and its effects on the mind. Is it moving in the direction of more peace gentleness, letting go. And just continue in your own time to move through the body, through the neck, to the shoulders, exploring all areas of those shoulders. Allowing that mindfulness imbued with kindness and warmth to soak through the shoulders and the skin into the bones, the joints, the muscles. As though caressing those shoulders. Inviting them to relax. Moving down the arms. Elbows, wrists and hands. Fingers and fingertips. Enjoying this experience of suffusing your body with kindfulness. Starting from the chest. Moving down from the collarbone to the chest area. The ribs, the belly. Soaking your whole torso through. Keeping the mind very gentle, relaxed. It's 
especially if you do come in contact with any sensations that are disagreeable. See if you can allow them to be there, give them space. And soaking through the whole back area. Down to the buttocks. The sides of the body leaving no part untouched. Just resting the mind, receiving any sensations without getting involved. Just a kind, gentle, friendly presence. starts to settle more and more deeply into the here and now. Moving into the hips, hip joints, and spreading down through the thighs. Noticing any pleasure in just being present and receptive and kind to the experience in your thighs in this present moment. See how deeply you can relax those thighs. Allowing any unnecessary tension to just drain away. and exploring the knees, any sensations in your knees. Sometimes we might have some pain in the knees. See if you can look, have a look a little more closely at those sensations. Maybe there's throbbing or 
pulsing tightness, heat. Notice what happens if you just send those sensations some kindness. Moving down the legs, through the calves, the shins, to the ankles, the feet, to the toes. Taking your time to really care for any sensations that arise. Allowing the lights of awareness to start turning up. Just by staying present with kindness. And just noticing if any part of the body has been left out. Feeling the whole body. As though the whole body was sitting in the warm sunshine. Nothing to do. Deeply relaxed. Just notice if the mind is snagging or grasping anything just a little too tightly. and invite it almost like a hand that you invite to just open. Just relax that little bit more. How does it feel to be present?
just resting in this place between the past and the future as though it's suspended in time. With a mind that's receptive, open and warm. And as you stay present, you may start to notice the contents of your mind. See if you can also establish a wise relationship of loving kindness, gentleness, and peace, allowing any thoughts to come in and just fade away. giving more attention to the way you're aware than any content in the thinking mind. And as the mind settles, you may also notice the silence starting to grow. The space between my words the beauty the peace of a simple silent mind. When silence visits you, see if you can treat her with great kindness and gentleness, deep appreciation, without demanding that she stay.
without grasping or clinging. We're just gently meeting and sinking in. to each moment of silence that visits your mind. Resting the mind. Allowing it to recharge. And if the mind is fairly quiet, you might even start to notice another visitor called the breath. If the breath comes to visit you, See if you can also receive the breath with a very kind and gentle mind. Enjoying each moment of a simple, single breath. like a gentle breeze on a hot, muggy day. You don't try to grasp or hold on to that breeze. You just notice it arising and passing away. Whatever you're aware of, whatever comes to visit you, keep on putting beautiful qualities of peace, gentleness and kindness in that space between knowing and the known.
So we're coming close to the end of this meditation. Let's take a few moments to notice any peace, lightness, awareness that's been developed. Notice how that feels in the body and in the mind. Noticing that that's available every time you remember this present moment. We meet it with kindness. Understanding that this is the place that our future is being made. Trusting that by staying still, mindfulness will start to grow as long as we don't allow it to start flowing out too far into the world. So I'm going to invite you when you open your eyes to stay centered, to see if you can move into the next activities by moving only your body, but staying quiet, collected inside. So that this continuity of mindfulness, mindfulness based on stillness, keep growing drop by drop, filling up those water tanks. So if you wish, you may open your eyes. I will spare you from my special gong effect. <laughs> Try that later. So just noticing even now the mind's tendency to start going out, looking for sense input. See if you can just keep it a little bit quieter than it might be normal. So I'm going to give you just a few tips for some walking meditation now. Uh, we're going to meet back at 1.15. So my suggestion is that for about half an hour, 20 minutes, you practice some walking meditation. So that between about 11.30 and 1.15, if that's long enough for you, you can prepare some lunch. And please do take your time. Make something nice and nourishing and healthy if you can. That's all part of being kindfully aware. So you have quite a bit of time. So if you'd like to try some walking meditation, this can be a really nice sort of bridge between the sitting and your everyday life. Not only a bridge or a fill-in, walking meditation is also a way to start turning up the lights in the mind because for some of us, especially if we're suffering with drowsiness or, you know, the mind is just a little bit restless or loud. The walking meditation just gives a little bit more for that mindfulness to, to uh, focus on. There's so much going on 
in the feet, in the legs. So with the mindful walking, it's, uh, it's different from ordinary walking because you're not trying to get anywhere. You're literally just choosing a path, which is perhaps the distance or the length of maybe your largest room, if you've got a small house like me. Even seven steps is enough. You might also choose to be outdoors. It can be nice to refresh the senses with a bit of nature as a very calming input. And you just explore how it feels to take a step, noticing the feelings, the sensations in the foot as it starts to lift, doing it a little bit more slowly than you'd normally walk, but not so slowly that you become stiff and tense. <laughs> Again, like sitting meditation, you start off maybe at a slightly slower speed than usual, but as the mind calms down, you'll find that that walking naturally slows down. So don't you know, go too far ahead and make it unnatural. Just explore whatever sensations arise in the foot as it lifts from the ground. So if you have a hand, it's like, it's like you lift the foot and you notice all the different sensations and then as it moves and as it lands back down, how does it land? What is the feeling of the weight or the pressure in the foot? What kind of sensations do you experience there? So it tends to include the field of weight, temperature, texture, especially if you do it barefoot. Um, so there's a lot to explore. There's a lot going on in the feet. And as I say, if you find that's too restrictive for the mind or you're going too slowly, you can adapt. You can go a bit more quickly or you can be aware of maybe the whole leg, the whole moving part of the body, yeah? So just adjust your awareness. Remember gentleness is also about the space, the distance between you and your object. Sometimes you want to have more distance, more space. Other times the mind just naturally wants to kind of hone in on a particular area. So see what works for you. So I suggest trying that for 20 minutes, half an hour, and then um, at 1.15, the invitation is from Claire Louise, actually. She's offered to do some mindful movement for about 10 minutes with you all. So it's optional because I don't think we included it in the schedule. But I, I was here last year with uh, Claire Louise in person in Bristol. And it was really, really nice because she'll get you to not only be mindful about how you're moving, but also some little exercises. It's like some tapping, I think she'll do. And that can also just stimulate the body and the mind a little bit, energize and recharge your mind. Yeah, so try not to eat too much so that you're really drowsy, but have a nice meal as well. And uh, as I say, see if you can, you know, focus on keeping those leaks plugged up as much as you can, not allowing your mind to start, you know, flowing out into anything that will overexcite or stimulate or maybe even trigger you. Mm -hmm. So please, if you can, it's just for a short day, no mobile phones, <laughs> no internet, if you can. So that is the suggestion. Okay, so yeah, the, the screen will be kept on. If you're moving around, you might want to stop your video. Uh, keep yourself on mute, please, if you can, to stop any background noise. And we'll meet again. Claire Louise will be here at 1.15 and I'll be back at about 1.25. Okay. Is there anything the co-host would like to just 